Hi, everyone. We'll get started. Welcome to the first Talks at 12 of the new academic year. It's a good thing. I'm Jeffrey Stanton. I'm the Communications and External Relations Manager here at Harvard Medical School. Our next talk, uh, if I could do this, is on October 28th, and it will be part of a day-long uh, celebration com com commemorating the anniversary of the 1969 initiative led by faculty and students that paved the way for a culture of diversity and inclusion at Harvard Medical School and the Harvard School of Dental Medicine. The talk called Then to Now will bring together school leadership for a discussion moderated by Dean for Diversity and Commun Community Partnership, Joan Reed, about the evolution of the school's diversity and inclusion initiatives. So save the date. In this monthly talk at 12 series, we've hosted a wide range of researchers and physicians who have shared the advances in medicine that are having a dramatic impact on human suffering and disease. Today, we will hear from a patient and his journey before and after receiving a life-saving, life-changing organ transplant. Once considered an experimental procedure with low success and high organ rejection rates, organ transplantation has transformed over the last 60 years through advances in medical and surgical procedures, becoming a viable treatment for many patients with end-stage organ disease. Approximately 80 Americans each day receive transplants, but the demand far exceeds supply. So Bill Tupper, who is here with us today, considers himself among the very fortunate to be among those who have a new lease on life. Bill is an engineer and a chemistry technologist at Brigham and Women's Clinical Labs here in Boston. Five and a half years ago and nearly 30 years since being diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, Bill underwent a simultaneous kidney pancreas transplant. Joining Bill are key members of his medical team, Melanie Honig, who is a clinical nephrologist at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. She was the course director for renal pathophysiology at Harvard Medical School for more than 12 years. She has served as co-chair for the recent curriculum reform at Harvard Medical School and is now the course director for homeostasis two, which includes renal, endocrine, and gastrointestinal pathophysiology. And Martha Pavlakis, who served as the medical director of kidney and pancreas transplantation at Beth Israel Deaconess for 20 years. She's also involved with the transplant education for renal fellows at BIDMC. Our speakers will take questions after today's presentation. If you're watching the Facebook or live uh, stream on YouTube, uh, submit your questions in the comment section below, <laughs> below the video. Uh, and now, please join me in welcoming Bill, Melanie, and Martha. Great, thank you all so much for coming. Um, it sounds like this will be a little bit different from some of the other sessions that have been held here because we're gonna really hear Bill's journey. And by way of disclaimer, I wanted to add that we've done this together before because Bill has been kind enough to share his story to first year medical students for several years now. And so when he tells his story to the students, there are different goals in mind, and perhaps he might go into a lot of, of the pathophysiology, which may be less relevant today. So it's possible that I will cut him off. And we've been together a long time and I think feel very comfortable with each other. So I don't think he's gonna be offended, but he'll tell us. And so he's gonna tell his story along with some uh, slides and then we will pepper that with some questions and add our views and also take a lot of questions from uh, you today. So Bill, you wanna start off? Sure. Welcome. So it's hard to say where your journey starts, but this is a picture. Uh, the baby is my father, and the man in the middle is my grandfather. He was, uh, this is 1932, so I'm thinking he was about 23, 22, 23 years old at that point. My grandfather, uh, at some point after this, within the next four years, would develop type 1 diabetes. And I don't know exactly what happens because you get sort of history from family members. One story was he took, uh, he wouldn't take insulin. And insulin was only relatively new. Uh, I think it was in the 20s when it first started being used and you had to boil syringes and to keep everything sterile. It, it, 
it was probably a less than pleasant experience. Not that it's a much more pleasant one now. Uh, anyway, he died in 1936. So four years after this picture was uh, taken. Is it in my genes? Uh, my brother doesn't have it. My sister doesn't have it. None of my kids have developed it at this point. But the one thing we have in common is the fact that we both developed it what I considered late. I was 25 when I became a type 1 diabetic, and he was in his uh, early t uh, 20s. So this is a picture of me. Um, and the reason why I show this picture is because this does have an impact on my diabetic struggle. When I was little, I was born with club feet. And so in the picture, in the color picture, you can see that I'm wearing casts. And in the picture next to it, you can see I'm wearing shoes that look like they're on the wrong feet. I wasn't being a wise ass, uh, which kids that age tend to be. It's just that's what they did for people that had club feet. It was something that was always with me. It was sort of like everybody was always talking about it, and it was just in the back, you know, don't run, don't do this, you know. And, and it, it just kind of got inside me so that when my journey continued and I became diabetic, I never was really outgoing about it, and I think that impacted me taking care of myself. So I had a job interview. Uh, this is uh, fast forward to 1984. I had a job interview in... Uh, upstate New York uh, at a company called Malincroyd Critical Care, uh, the world leader in endotracheal tubes. Uh, and I got the job, and they said, all you need is a physical. Well, this was the time where, uh, actually, Harvard Medical, uh, which was, what was the, the first Harvard uh, uh, program uh, for health insurance had started, and I had that. Seeing a PCP for a physical, for a job, or for anything, would literally take nine to 18 months. So I was driving home, and there was a health stop there. So I stopped at the health stop, and I went in, and this is also uh, three months before, two to three months before I was getting married. And uh, I'm just sitting there, nobody else was there, there was a doctor and a nurse, and the doctor came out and said, we'd like to put you in the hospital. And I'm just kind of like, what? And uh, she said, well, you're diabetic. I said, what? Um, and I said, you know what? I think this will let me get an appointment with my PCP, so I'll call them in the morning. The, honestly, they were good. They followed up with me. They made sure I did what I was supposed to do, but I did avoid going into the hospital. Um, and I was doing okay. Uh, I, I kind of, being a scientist, engineer type person, I said, okay, I'm an experiment. I'll be in an experiment. So at the time... Uh, you know, even doing finger sticks for blood glucose checks, that was all kind of relatively new, but I was, I was willing to do it. And then I got a job where I started to travel, and that did me in. Uh, traveling and diabetes, some people can do that, and they're so disciplined. Those are the people that you hate, that get up in the morning, no matter where they are, and they said, oh, I ran six miles this morning before I had coffee. Um, I'm not that person. I was not a disciplined enough person to be able to do that. So things kind of fell apart. So this is in the early 90s. I'm traveling all over the world. Uh, and then in sometime around 1996, I had a physical. And my doctor said, oh, it looks like you're spilling a little bit of protein in your urine. So I'm going to put you on this drug called Avapro. And honestly, that was it. 1996, put me on that medicine. And there was really no further talk about it. I would get semi-regular physicals, and, but nothing new and exciting. Why don't I interrupt just there for one second? Um, this is a class of medicines that decreases pressure in the glomeruli, the kidney filters, and so would decrease wear and tear over time. And protein spilling is one of the first signs of diabetic kidney disease, and so this is pretty standard. And the other things that would be important in addition to medicines like this would be controlling the sugar and sort of everything you're supposed to do anyway. So as we move forward, I use this slide mainly because if you look at diabetes being the center leaf that's on that web, diabetes has so many different diseases that spring from it. So I had started kidney disease, and then in the... Uh, uh, mid-2000s, around 2004, 2005, 
I was working, and all of a sudden, a little droplet of blood inside my eye appeared. You could just watch it go down. It was like a shadow box image, uh, which I probably would have ignored, except what happened is it dispersed, and then it just spread, and it clouded my vision. So I went to see my ophthalmologist, and he told me what was going on. And I had been treated for retinopathy with laser treatment, where they actually go in and just kind of shoot with a laser the capillaries that form because of diabetes. Uh, but this was, was the next phase, where it was starting to leak. So of kidney, uh, I mean, of the diabetic uh, diseases or complications, I've had retinopathy. And I still get followed for that. I mean, it doesn't go away because I've been transplanted. Um, I have a little bit of arterial sclerosis. Um, I've had high blood pressure, uh, which, because it affected my kidneys, my kidneys decided, well, we're going to give you high blood pressure, too. So I've had a lot of little diseases. I will say I'm very lucky in some respects because I, I had a small instance in the hospital a couple of years ago, and the gentleman I was sharing a room with was diabetic. Uh, he actually had lost a limb, but it wasn't due to diabetes, but he basically had neuropathy. I mean, it, it was something where I couldn't even, you know, I knew of neuropathy as something as like, you know, tingling in your fingers that could be quite painful and in your feet and stuff. His like body was neuropathy, and it just, I, you know, all but for the grace of God. Um, there's just so many complications, and some people have more, some people have less. Mine definitely related to the fact that I wasn't taking as good a care of myself as I should. Some people take wonderful care of themselves and still have complications. Uh, it's just one of those diseases. Um, so at one point, uh, I went to see my doctor my PCP, and my creatinine had gone up to 1.7, which is high. It's high normal, but high. And he said, I think it's time for you to see uh, maybe a nephrologist. So at that point, I decided I would go back. A long time ago, I had gone to Joslin. I went back to Joslin, saw an endocrinologist. He looked at my uh, labs, and he says, I want you to see a uh, nephrologist. And that's how I met Dr. Honick. And so that, that journey began sometime around 2009. I think it was around 2000. It's, it's been about, I don't know, 19 years? I mean, 12 years or something like that. Anyway, uh, my kidneys were starting the slow descent. And there wasn't like a pill that they could give me that would make it go away or anything like that. Uh, and she was quite frank. She sat me down and um, just said to me, uh, you're either going to need a transplant or you're going to need to go on dialysis, or both. You know, one of you know, and uh, she said at the time I was in my late 40s, early 50s. She said, "Well, basically, you're relatively young, and uh, you know, that's you know, if I was like 85, it would be a whole different story. But I wasn't 85, so uh, and I began uh, seeing her on a much more regular basis." Uh, just following the progress, and she would adjust my medications to try and keep me balanced. I had to adjust myself and try and take much more better care of myself, which I eventually started to do. I probably never got perfect, but I got my A1C down into the 8 range. They like it under 7, but there was a point where I think it was well over 12, maybe even hit 14. Uh, so... As I'm progressing down, it's not something that happens overnight. It, it just you just keep sliding down. And one of the weird things about kidney disease is, in 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 a chronic situation, is you just don't all of a sudden feel like crap. It's over time, and as as your body changes, you adjust to it. So I never really felt like I was getting sicker or anything like that. I was. But I just felt like, oh, my body's adjusted to this new way of being either tired or whatever. Uh, and at one point, uh, Dr. Honig said, you know, it's time that you talk to the transplant team. So uh, we set up an appointment. Uh, my first uh, call was with uh, 
the transplant nurse, who my daughter works with now, uh, and she, um, we did a long call. She said, these are the things you have to get done. You have to get all sorts of testing, stress testing, blood work, uh, blood typing, uh, a whole bunch of things. So, so why don't I interrupt you? Sure. Oh, sorry. Why don't I interrupt you again for a moment? Yep. First, I just wanted to explain the hemoglobin A1C. Okay. Um, so you mentioned A1C. So red blood cells uh, live in your body for a fixed amount of time. And during the course of the time that they're in your body, if the sugars are high, then think about them being sort of decorated by sugar. And we can assess what last several months. So we use that as a sort of marker. And you talked about a few different numbers. And so ideally, uh, we, depending on age and other factors, we might want someone's hemoglobin A1C to be under seven or closer to a little lower to be close to normal. And you mentioned higher numbers. What I'd love to do is just interrupt you for another second and ask Dr. Pavlakis to talk for a moment about seeing patients in clinic for kidney pancreas. And, and also, if you don't mind mentioning, um, one of the things that I have always loved about how you approach a patient with uh, who's being considered for pancreas is that you do not judge them for uh, the journey that they have taken because having diabetes and caring for it's very hard. That, that's exactly right. Yes, um, thank you. It's very interesting to hear your story, Bill. I know pieces of it, but it's nice to hear it going back to your grandfather. Um, thank you for sharing that. So um, at this point in this process, Bill mentioned that um, his doctor, Dr. Honig, had said it's time to start looking into transplant. And the way that happens, people sort of have a sense of what being on the list means, being on the transplant list. That, that I think, is sort of familiar generally to the public. Um, but the way one gets on the list is through a transplant center. So um, Bill mentioned that he um, called and had a conversation with the transplant coordinator. Um, a transplant coordinator is generally an RN who specializes in transplantation. And um, you mentioned that she said, okay, you're gonna have to get a lot of testing done. So taking a step back, um, you might wonder, why doesn't he, Dr. Honig get to put him on the list? Or why doesn't he just get to get on the list? What is the testing about? Um, and if we think about the transplant procedure itself, it actually, like any operation, um, has a risk of bad outcomes, death, um, injury from the transplant surgery itself. And then at the time of transplant, we give you a lot of immune suppressants, a class of medications that prevent your own immune system from battling infections and cancers and organ transplants. So we use it to help your body accept the transplant, but then unfortunately you're at higher risk of infections and cancers. So one of the most important things about the screening to put somebody on the list is to make sure that they don't have infections or cancers that would make the transplant procedure even more risky. There will always be some risk associated with any operation, um, but to, in order to get on the list, we have to make sure that um, there's a good chance that the transplant will help you and not harm you. So that's what the testing is about. And um, the process for getting on the list involves not only a conversation with the coordinator, but actually coming into the transplant center. It is a federally mandated process whereby you have to meet with a transplant medical specialist for kidneys. It would be like myself, a transplant nephrologist, a transplant surgeon, a transplant social worker, a transplant nutritionist, and the transplant nurse coordinator. You also have to get some basic testing to make sure that you're healthy enough to undergo the transplant. And some of that testing, again, is federally mandated. It's not up to each transplant center to sort of invent the process um, for themselves. And then once somebody is deemed healthy enough to qualify to get listed, then you get on the transplant list. And as Dr. Honig mentioned, each patient comes to transplant having walked down their own individual journey. And we, we are in some sense standing in judgment of patients because we're judging if you have active cancer, if you're battling a malignancy, a transplant will harm you. It's not the right choice. Um, if you are somebody who absolutely can't take their medications properly, then the transplant will fail because the body will recognize the transplant as a foreign invader and attack it. 
So we do somewhat stand in judgment, the, but the judgment is always grounded in the value that we wanna make sure the transplant's gonna help you and not hurt you as much as we possibly can. Um, what we try not to do is judge how somebody got there. So there's no sense of um, this kidney disease you couldn't help because you inherited it. This other kidney disease is your own <laughs> fault because you used drugs or you didn't manage your A1C properly. There's none of that. We basically look at people as they come to us and try to determine if transplant is going to help them or not. Um, and that is very important. Sometimes people come to the transplant process with a sense that they have to deserve to get on the list and that means being a good person. Well, we actually, we want somebody we can work with, but you could be an ex-convict. You could not be an ex-convict. You could be, a, you know, we don't judge patients. I've also heard people say, well, um, this is a good candidate for transplant. She's got two kids at home. You know what, parents are no better or worse candidates than people who have not had children. We, we go by very objective medical criteria, which is to say, again, whether or not the transplant will help you, or are you at risk for the transplant actually harming you, and then that's somebody we would not wanna put on the list. So we do try to approach um, the list in as objective and data-driven a way as possible. So. so so what this letter represents, so I went through a bunch of testing, and when I uh, first met the, uh, my surgeon, uh, Dr. Kwaja, uh, he, I had told him I had had a gallbladder attack 10 years ago, never had it removed or anything like that. He said, let's get an image of that. I had that removed. Uh, he, did, he removed the, the gallbladder. And that's when I actually started to feel sick uh, because all of the medicines that I was taking to try and you know slow progress and stuff like that, didn't like the fact that all of a sudden I went through surgery and and, and it was you know uh, it wasn't a heavy duty surgery. Well, all surgeries sort of are, but I was in and out of the hospital in a day. Uh, but the thing is, is that it just kind of changed my chemistry, so to speak, and I just couldn't move. I was. The, the, I was just literally could not walk. I was just down. So uh, talked a lot to Dr. Honig. Uh, and at one point, I had my uh, blood pressure checked. And I had been riding a little bit more on the higher side. And all of a sudden, I'm like 92 over 40 or something. It was very low. And for me, it was very low. And at that point, she said, well, Avapro, which I had been taking since 1996, why don't we get rid of that just to see what happens? Uh, and I stopped taking that, and all of a sudden things kind of turned around for me. So Dr. Honig kind of mentioned a little bit this thing called GFR, uh, which is sort of the filtration rate your kidneys have. And what they look at that. So the filtration rate should go, should be high, and your creatinine should be low. So what was happening to me is my creatinine was going high and my filtration rate was going low. And it, it, it dropped a lot prior, right after the uh, gallbladder surgery. Uh, and honestly, miraculously, it turned around. So it went from about eight back up to 14. I mean, it was a temporary thing. It wasn't like I was cured. Uh, but I was able to remove that medicine and I was had energy again, so I was able to... I. One of the things, and this is stupid, but in my head, I wanted to keep working. So I literally kept working up until the day I had my surgery. I just, I never, I, I don't think I even really called in sick. Uh, and that's just my own problems with my head thinking I have to work all the time. But uh, so after that period, I had actually uh, was at a stage where Dr. Quadra and Dr. Honig thought it might be time to put in an access port for dialysis. Uh, I was put on the list for, uh, I guess, a perfect kidney, but I had to lose weight before I could get a pancreas, and I wasn't on dialysis, so I wasn't gaining any time. The one thing in my favor is that my blood type was AB positive, so I'm kind of the universal recipient, um, <clears throat> which is, much different. So 
my initial visit with the transplant team, one of the residents said to me, well, you know, it's going to be eight to 10 years in the Boston area to get a, a kidney if you can't find your own donor. And uh, then once he read a little bit further, he saw it was AB positive, he said, oh, it'll only be three years. So, but it makes a difference, and it also makes a difference where you are. That's why he qualified it by uh, geographical location. Anyway. Hold on. Let's take a little break because I want to unpack some of those things. Um, Martha, can you... Uh, so, uh, Bill, you mentioned that you were feeling very poorly after the gallbladder surgery, right. and your blood pressure turned out to be low. You had lost some weight and did not need as much medication. And when we took back some of that medication, you got a little bit more kidney function, just enough so that you didn't need dialysis at that time. And that gave us the luxury of sort of finishing up your workup and getting you ready for the list. So Martha, can you talk a little bit maybe then about waiting time on the list, regions, whatever else you think is relevant from that? Um, so some of what you said has since changed. So the allocation system is actually um, a federally run um, contract called the Organ Procurement and Transplant Network, OPTN, and that contract is held and always has been held since its inception by a nonprofit company called UNOS, U-N-O-S, United Network for Organ Sharing. And UNOS um, basically is the body by which um, policies and algorithms for organ allocation gets administered. Um, and some of what you said is so interesting because in December 2014, the rules changed. So when you said you were on the list, but only for a perfect match kidney and you couldn't gain time until you started dialysis, that all went away. So currently, um, and this is just for a kidney now, once the GFR that they were mentioning, which normally should be 80 to 120, once it gets down to 20 or less, which is close to stage five or near end stage kidney failure, that is bad enough for us, as long as you qualify, to be able to put you on the list. And once we put you on the list, now you gain time towards a transplant, doesn't matter if you're on dialysis or not. Um, and that was a new allocation rule from December 2014 when the allocation changed. Um, and then as you progress further, some people can get a transplant before starting dialysis, but most can't. It's really interested when you said a resident told you eight to 10 years, it's never been eight to 10 years in this region. So that's actually was inaccurate information. And I'm not surprised of everything you said that's the first time my ears pricked up and I thought, ooh, that's not right. He was told inaccurate information because it's very difficult to get accurate information on waiting times. The way you calculate an average waiting time is you take a group of people put on the transplant list and the median waiting time is when 50% of them have reached a transplant. So, but some of those people get transplants in ways that are a little expedited, a little fast, like Bill mentioned, he's the universal recipient. So when you're looking at median waiting times, do you want to count in people who can get a, an organ from anyone? Do you want to count in people whose loved one donates an organ so they're a recipient of a live donor kidney? So it's, it's just very hard. There are some regions in the country where the wait time for a kidney is around 10 years. There's other regions of the country where the wait time for a kidney is between one to two years. And this is a geographic disparity, which you can read about in the newspaper. It's actually dominated the news um, in terms of uh, UNOS policies. I'm the vice chair of the UNOS Kidney Committee, and we're in the process of putting forward, I can tell you, a very controversial policy change to try to eliminate some of those geographic disparities. But kidneys, um, all organs are allocated currently on the basis of regions. So region one is Massachusetts, Maine, New Hampshire, not Vermont, oddly, Rhode Island, a little piece of Vermont, and Connecticut. And that is region one. And within region one, there's two donor service areas, and neither regions nor DSAs were designed to facilitate equitable organ allocation. They're administrative um, regions. So we're proposing a, a radical change now for organ allocation. But dating back to when Bill was waiting, it is true that you couldn't gain wait time on the list until you were actually on dialysis. And that's a rule that, that was changed. Um, I got lost in allocation. What was the other, th is that mm. enough? Or is there another yep. thing I should address? There'll probably be more. Okay, <laughs> all right. Because <laughs> I know I've got something in my head that'll probably spark you up a little bit. Sure. Um, 
So anyway, um, I needed to lose weight, though, to get add pancreas to things. And I... Explain why... Who, get, who is eligible for a pancreas, and why would Bill need to lose weight? So um, first off, just quite simply in terms of weight, a kidney alone transplant is an incision made in the lower quadrant of the abdomen, usually the right lower quadrant. What the surgeons do is make an incision. They take the entire peritoneal sac and push it aside so they don't go through the abdomen. I mean, it's down in the quadrant there. And they attach the kidney um, to the major blood vessel supplying the leg, and the ureter draining the urine, urine from the kidney is attached right to your own bladder. Um, a pancreas transplant involves a connection of the new pancreas to your intestines. So the incision for a pancreas transplant goes from right under the breastbone all the way down to the top of the pubic bone. And that is a bigger and harder to recover stop. from operation. Um, so... If you look uh, quickly. Yeah. Uh, there you go. <laughs> There's the pancreas transplant. So you can see in yellow is the organ, the pancreas. And the brown little area attached to it is part of the gut of the donor. And the exocrine secretions, the juices that help you in digestion, have to go somewhere. So the surgeons keep that portion of the donor duodenum. And you can see they've attached it side to side to recipient intestine. And again, because it's such a bigger midline incision and because we're giving somebody a lot of immunosuppression, when somebody has abdominal weight, that makes it, that incision much more likely to break down, have wound infections. Um, and there's other reasons as well, but that's one of the biggest reasons that we require people to be of a certain body mass index or lower, but not too low, before um, we can approve them for transplant. Whereas a kidney transplant, we're a little bit less strict about weight limitations. Well, and lastly, then, who is eligible, oh, who is eligible for a, a pancreas? So the most common way a pancreas is um, allocated is, like Bill got, in combination with a kidney, both organs from a deceased donor that go into a type 1 diabetic, somebody who's completely without insulin, completely dependent on their pump or injections for insulin. So type 1 diabetic um, can get both. You can also get a pancreas transplant alone, either after a kidney transplant or without transplantation in your history ever, but that's much less common. So let's just talk about the simultaneous pancreas kidney. Each center is allowed to set what their rules are for a simultaneous pancreas kidney. Because the outcomes get worse after the age of 55, we limit it to 55 years or less, body mass index 30 or less for a type 1 diabetic. It also has been shown that some type 2 diabetics can benefit from a kidney pancreas transplant. Um, and that, that type 2 diabetes is a situation where there's not only insufficient insulin, but there's also resistance to insulin, often in the setting of having extra body weight. So that the type 2 diabetic that we approve can't be um, in the category of obese. But so we do very few type 2 diabetics. Mostly it's a type 1, a patient with type 1 diabetes, kidney failure, and then they could be eligible for both within age and, and body mass index limitation. So one of the things I had to do when I was first being tested is, um, obviously I was taking insulin, so they couldn't test me for insulin to prove that I was type 1 because I was going to be positive for insulin. So there's a, another uh, enzyme that's produced at the same time when you're a normal functioning, have a normal functioning pancreas uh, called C-peptide. So that was tested, and in my case, or in any type 1's case, it was essentially zero. Uh, you would have a different level as a regular functioning person. So it, it proved, because I, I developed it late, and it, they just wanted to make sure that I was indeed a type 1 diabetic. So Bill, now you're on the list. This is a letter saying that you're on the list, and... Um, and we're hoping that you will get a kidney and pancreas before we need to start dialysis. But I'm nervous because we don't have that much time. Just that low blood pressure a few months before made you feel poorly. And then what happened? So uh, I got my body mass index in line in September of 2000, I mean, in December of 2013. So this is the letter saying that I'm on the list for both a kidney and a pancreas. Now, what might have changed, but was different back then, at least, or could be the same, is that it's a different list. Mm -hmm. So 
so that three years or whatever I was originally told kind of went away, and Dr. Mandelbrot, who was my doctor at the time, said, ah, two to three months. I mean, he was actually that casual about it. And I, I remember talking to Dr. Honick, and she said, you know, <laughs> ease back a little bit, maybe about a year. So, uh, so I think on the 28th of December, it was all really official. Um, and so, well, let's go back. So anyway, um, on uh, January went by, February went by. Towards the end of February, <clears throat> um, Chris, my wife, and I had planned to go see uh, uh, Paul Simon and Sting at uh, the TD Garden. And every time we plan something, like we get tickets for each other for Christmas, something always happens. It's usually something stupid. This wasn't stupid. Uh, <laughs> So I had taken off March 3rd, and uh, I was just going about my day. I had gone to see my parents. I had dropped my daughter off at yoga, picked up my daughter, who was going to start. Oh, by the way, I worked at BI at the time. So I, I kind of knew a lot of the inner workings of BI, which is where I had my transplant. Uh, and my daughter was actually going to start as a nurse the next day at BI. So she went to yoga, I picked her up from yoga, I came home, it was cold, I had thrown my coat down, and my phone started to ring. And uh, there was a message, I could hear the message, but I couldn't get to it in time, and it was BI. And I'm thinking, okay, well, for my job, I had to wear a pager. If there was something wrong at the lab, they would have paged me. Um, so I look at the number and I say, and I'm waiting for the message, and then I get the message, and it's from my transplant nurse, and she said, um, and this is where it gets a little weird. I mean, this is great for me, but it gets a little weird because when you think about getting a donor, getting donor organs, there is somebody else involved, not you know, a family. You know? And I get a phone call saying, uh, I listen to the message, Bill, we have a 20-year-old uh, set of organs for you, which sounds great. It's like, Oh, I just, you know, I found a, you know, a brand new car. It only has 10,000 miles on it. I can get you a good deal on it. Um, <clears throat> so I called back, and, you know, for me, it was all relative euphoria. So I'm trying to gesture to my daughter what's going on. We call my wife. Uh, the nurse, Linda, said, okay, I don't want you to go into the emergency room. I'll call you as you're coming in. We'll just put you right in your room. So... We come flying into Boston. My daughter came with, came with us, and uh, we go up to the room, and there I am, all ready to go. Uh, I had met with uh, the surgeon. So my surgeon, or the, my surgeon, the original surgeon that I had met with, Dr. Kwaja, wasn't on call. So like having a baby, you don't necessarily get the obstetrician. Uh, and I uh, had Dr. Raven. She came in, and she told me what was going on. So my organs were being um, donated in Pennsylvania. They, would be, they wouldn't be donated until sometime around midnight, so the surgery wouldn't be until morning. So we're just kind of sitting there, and now I start thinking all of a sudden I'm like dressed like this. I could have one more meal, uh, and what are we going to do with the tickets? So I called my boss, see if she wanted them. I called Dr. Honig, see if she wanted them. Uh, the, uh, my, the person that, uh, the nurse that, my admitting nurse, uh, Chris went up to her and said, would you like the tickets? And see, the problem is the tickets were worth more than $50. I couldn't give them away, not to medical personnel, because I might get special privileges. So um, I'm kind of stuck with the tickets uh, there for a while. But the admitting nurse, Tracy, said, why don't you go? And I said, well, you know, look at me. You know, I have an IV in my arm and, and stuff like that. And she said, hold on a second. So she went, she called Dr. Raven. Dr. Raven said, be back by midnight. You can go. <laughs> so we went to the concert. I, I don't know why it's jumping around. Anyway, there we are at the concert. Um, and uh, I just remember, so one of the side effects of kidney disease is your red blood cells kind of drop a little bit. And I just shivered all the time. So it was a great concert, but I was freezing the entire time. I just shivered and shivered and shivered. I was supposed to be back by midnight, 
I got back at 5 of midnight. It's kind of like a Cinderella story. I get back at 5 of midnight and realize that the building that my room is in, that's all locked up. I can't get in that way. And fortunately, I was happy at that point. I did work there because I knew I could get in another building and walk across. So I was able to get back into my room. I may have missed the midnight uh, thing by a little bit. And uh, you didn't turn into a pumpkin. no, I didn't turn into a pumpkin. My uh, so my wife and daughter, uh, my I, I forget where my daughter had been for the concert, but anybody, everybody seemed to be there. Oh, my wife, my daughter was at home. My wife was there, but my wife was going to drive my daughter to work the next morning. But she was thinking, well, I'll stay in, in the hospital because they're going to bring me down to the OR in uh, at four thirty. Anyway, uh, they didn't bring me down at 4.30. Uh, Chris was able to go home and come back because while you watch this stuff on TV, they're always flying organs all over the place. My organs came up uh, in a car from Pennsylvania. And uh, when I was in the PACU, uh, not the PACU, when I was in pre-op, my surgeon is walking up and down the, the uh, hallway swearing. Uh, I had been given a happy drug when they put in the IV, so I didn't care. But she was, she was a little bit upset because they, they, they don't just come in, throw you into the OR. They have to check the organs. She didn't uh, do the surgery to remove them. So, you know, was there enough to work with? And was it fatty or anything like that? So uh, I didn't get moved downstairs to the operating room until uh, 7, no, to pre-op until 7.30. It wasn't operated on until 9.30 because they were stuck, my organs, my organs, they were stuck in traffic. Um, so you may have been driving right by them, you know. Um, so anyway, I, I had the surgery, uh, and that's, that was the outcome of the surgery. And there I am in the PACU afterwards, uh, and then a year and a half later, uh, a, a mentor, a friend of mine uh, from college, uh, he had had kidney cancer. And he had been on the list a long time, uh, on and off the list, because they had to make sure he was, kid he was cancer free. Uh, and the first time we had reconnected a few years earlier, he had just had uh, his access put in for hemodialysis. He, uh, he ended up getting his kidney transplant, uh, and this is the story of how things are shifted around. He got an, he's a little bit older than me. He got an older kidney, um, which he was more than happy to deal with. He's doing great now. Uh, oddly enough, though, the reason why this picture is of any interest at all is that he's in the same spot I was in when I had my surgery. So we were in basically, I can't say it's the same bed, but it was the same spot. So, Bill, uh, I want to wrap up so we have time for questions. Can you just say one thing about what it's like to no longer need insulin? And then you had gotten sidetracked, but I know you wanted to say something special about the organs that you received and that gift. So, uh, well, first of all, my last shot of insulin was as they were wheeling me down to the operating room. Um, it, you can never say never to anything, uh, but... Hopefully that was my last shot of insulin. Um, my donor, um, it becomes, at first, like I said, Linda told me it was 20-year-old organs. It took me a year. At, at one point, Dr. Mandelbrot had left. I had moved over to working with Dr. Pavlakis, who I think I met the day after my surgery. Uh, and uh, for me to ask, you can find out age, sex, and cause of death, cause of death. Cause of death. Uh, I was not ready for a lot of it. <laughs> I know it's not much information. I wasn't ready for a lot of information. But it was a male. Uh, I asked a year later. Uh, he was 20 years old. I don't know. I haven't asked the cause of death. Um, I don't know that I ever will ask the cause of death. Um, because he's 20 years old. He, he was, you know, in the prime of his life. It, it could have been a lot of different things. And if you ever go to YouTube and you look up there's a story about a donor named uh, uh, Connor Eckhart, I think his name is. He, uh, he went to a party when he was like 19, 20 years old, and he smoked some uh, artificial grass. Uh, it's like potpourri, and I don't know quite. Anyway, he, it killed him. 
And the whole video on YouTube shows his organs being dispersed and his family. And it wasn't him. This was in California. But, you know, it was just a real person. And in that, in Connor's situation, it was just one mistake. You know, just that was it. Um, it he had a severe reaction to it. And uh, fortunately, he helped, I don't know, maybe up to eight people. Uh, by donating kidneys, lungs, hearts. The end of the video is really tough to watch because the helicopter is taking off, taking his heart to a different hospital. So. I thought, sorry. <laughs> I thought uh, that would be a good spot to end and maybe we could take some questions uh, directed at any of us from uh, the audience. I have a question that already came in from uh, YouTube. Do you think that there will be a day when we can create artificial kidneys? Yes. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, I would say yes, because uh, if you think about the exponential pace of technological innovation, I can't see it not happening. We actually do have artificial kidneys. It's called dialysis. It's outside the body, and it's what's keeping hundreds of thousands of people alive. Um, the challenge is getting the artificial kidney that we have to be able to be implantable and permanent. And that we haven't gotten to yet. So we do have artificial kidneys. They are not implantable yet. Um, my dream is either that or somebody like Bill in renal failure comes to the transplant clinic. A technician does a scraping of the inside of their cheek. We say, come back in six weeks. We'll grow your kidney for you. And again, a surgical technician sews it in and we don't need the immunosuppressants. I mean, there's all sorts of dreams I have. And what I tell <laughs> patients is, um, you know, I, I am really hoping that at some point these things will happen, and wherever I am, I want someone to come shake me awake from my nap in the nursing home and tell me about <laughs> it. <laughs> not right around the corner, but hopefully it's not too far off. Hi, Bill. Hi. Thank you for sharing your story. That was really um, touching and also really informative. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about, um, you mentioned that um, your organs came from Pennsylvania, but I don't think they are in um, the region that you mentioned earlier. So can you just talk a little bit more about how, you know, not getting too much into the details, like how the organs actually move around the different regions? Absolutely. Um, so what we currently have is organs are allocated locally, then regionally, then nationally. And um, it's an algorithm, basically. So when you are put on the list, all of you, your information and some of your important biologic characteristics are put into the algorithm. And then when somebody becomes a donor, they are also evaluated and their important biological information is put in. And then a match run is created. A match run is basically a list generated um, saying the top person on the list is patient X at hospital X, and that person's transplant team is called and offered the organs. Now, if that patient actually just had a heart attack, uh, they, you know, or they can't find that person that evening, they quickly say no, and it goes to number two on the list, number three on the list. Kidney pancreas offers um, are a little bit harder to place because there's fewer people with type 1 diabetes waiting for those organs. Um, and so what must have happened, Pennsylvania is in another region, and what must have happened is that nobody in the region um, qualified for those organs, and so they immediately, because they want to place the organs quickly, went just outside the region, and Bill's name must have come up. So some organs are placed nationally ahead of everyone else in the region. For instance, one of your biological characteristics might be that you, as the candidate, waiting for an organ, that you have a lot of proteins in your blood that would fight other people's transplanted organs. And if you have a lot of these that develop either through pregnancy, transfusion, or prior transplant, it might be very hard to transplant you. So we prioritize those people nationally. So an organ becomes available in Arizona, and the algorithm first looks to see if there's anybody in the country that is what we call 100% sensitized or loaded with these antibodies that make them very hard to transplant who could get that organ and accept it. And if they do, it goes there first. And so there's a very complex algorithm, and I'm guessing that nobody in the Pennsylvania regional list 
could or did accept these organs. Since, as you say, they were from a 20-year-old donor, um, I'm guessing that it was there was nobody with that blood type that was ready for transplantation. So they came outside the region to bear. We have a question from Egypt. Can you clarify the impact of a cancer diagnosis on organ transplantation? Does any history of cancer exclude an individual from inclusion on the transplant list? Or is it possible to receive a donor organ if the cancer is in remission and tests are normal? Um, very simple answer, depends on the cancer, but yes, it's absolutely possible to get organ transplantation if your cancer is not only in remission, but many of these cancers have a very low chance of coming back and your testing is normal. There's usually a wait time. So even if you've had a wonderful response to your cancer therapy and everybody is very encouraged, often there's either a two, a four, or even a five-year wait time before we deem it safe to proceed with organ transplantation. Um, and it really varies from cancer to cancer, but many patients with a history of cancer um, do qualify for and end up getting transplants. Yeah, I have a question here. Um, so um, thank you for sharing this knowledge. And I, um, I'm currently working on transplantation research. So I'm pretty interested in like the immune response after transplantation. Because I think you guys just mentioned about immune suppression drugs, um, which could be used after transplantation. Um, so because um, my research is a lot, like a lot of academia things. So I'm pretty interested in what is like the clinical stage about immunosuppression drugs, like how effective they are. Are they only two T cells, or both T cells and B cells can be controlled? Um, so I can touch on the mechanistic side, and Bill, you can touch on what it's like to live on immunosuppression. Um, so what, as you know, the immune system is designed to protect us from foreign invaders, internal tumors, and it is brilliant. The adaptive immune system really has multiple different avenues. So even if one of the arms of your immune system is dysfunctional, there's other ones that can protect you, um, very important to the survival of any species. So the current immune suppression that we use is multifaceted so that we're targeting different limbs of the immune system. So um, there's three main drugs that people tend to be on. One is a calcineurin inhibitor, and this is basically any lymphocytes that get activated by interacting with the antigen they're programmed to respond to that message has to get to the cell's nucleus in order to turn on gene transcription and make a, an immune response. And the calcineurin inhibitors prevent the message from the cell surface from getting to the nucleus. So, and that's in lymphocytes B and T, predominantly T. Another class of drugs we use are called the antiproliferatives. So anytime you have an immune response, a cell recognizes an invading protein, the very next important step is that you have to have a lot of cell reproduction to create an army to fight that invader. If just one little cell is running around trying to fight it, it can't do it. So the cell reproduction involves a lot of DNA replication. So the antiproliferatives like mycophenolate and azathioprine block cell replication. So even though the cell may, the antigen may trigger an immune response, it doesn't turn into an army to fight the invader, This, in this case, the transplant. And then there's good old prednisone which has a lot of effects. There's glucocorticoid response elements on DNA promoter regions that prednisone inhibits. It decreases inflammation. It calms down arms of the innate immune system. Um, and so those are generally three types of agents. So we try to block the immune system in different ways to both keep the person from rejecting their organs, but also keep them healthy. If we use too much immunosuppressant, the person is more likely to die from infections and cancers. As, as far as being on immunosuppressors, fortunately, and uh, Dr. Pavlakis would probably have to explain it, but I'm not on prednisone. Many people, particularly kidney only, are. It also is somewhat, uh, I think, dependent on where you had your transplant. Um, but I'm on um, two drugs, uh, tacrolimus and mycophenolate. And... Uh, you start at a relatively high dose, and I actually talked to a colleague that has recently become a pharmacist, and he said that, at least with like tacrolimus, it takes a while for it to kind of build up in your system, um, and then as it's built up, and I may be wrong about how it d has done that, but my dosage has come down. I'm on a very low dose of tacrolimus, and I'm on, uh, I'm on half the dose I was originally of mycophenolate. Uh, initially, for me, 
uh, I had, and I still do a little bit, my hands shake. I have like the pseudo Parkinson's type thing. So if I'm handing somebody a piece of paper, it'll shake. Or if I say, you know, look at my a picture of my dogs, uh, it'll look like my dogs are wagging because <laughs> my hand will be shaking. But it's not all the time. I, I work in a lab. I can pipette without any difficulty. Uh, but it's just something that I have. Uh, I think both drugs can kind of cause sleeplessness. I've heard that mycophenolate is maybe the bigger contributor to that. Uh, I've had some trouble sleeping, but it's gotten better. And uh, I guess my body is adjusted. Uh, you know, a, a lot of people complain about losing hair. My dad was bald, my brother's bald. You know, I don't think I've really lost much more hair. Honestly, you know, I read about a lot of, on uh, transplant sites on Facebook. Uh, I understand. For women, it's a lot different. Uh, if I had to, I'd just shave my head. I, I don't really see that as a big uh, hindrance. I've never had some of the complications that you read of on the bottles, you know, gastrointestinal problems or anything like that. Uh, and compared to insulin, so with insulin, you have to understand, even if you have a pump, you know, some insulins have to be refrigerated. I mean, obviously the ones in the pump isn't refrigerated, but some have to be insulated. Traveling with needles and traveling with uh, caps and different things like that is really a pain. Uh, it's so easy for me to collect my pills and just take off. Uh, when I was diabetic, I went to a conference in Dusseldorf, uh, went to take my uh, short-acting insulin and realized that it was still in Danvers. So I had to go to a, uh, a chemist in, in Dusseldorf and try to figure out with him what I could do. And he was able to give me some inserts that were uh, pretty much the same. So I was able to, because I was there for two weeks. Uh, and uh, it's, insulin is just a very difficult thing, sort of to travel with. I will say I was lucky. I never had a, a card that said I'm a, I'm a diabetic. Uh, when I went through um, you know, the TSA, I just took my insulin out. They never questioned me or anything like that. But, uh, so life on immunosuppressants, for me, and whatever is with my body chemistry, has not been, I mean, it's, compared to insulin, it's, it's a cakewalk, but it hasn't been bad. I have one final question from YouTube. Um, could you speak uh, a little bit about the organ donation process? specifically what rules are in place to ensure that individuals that have chosen to donate their organs upon death will have their wishes honored? So there's two ways to have your organs donated. Um, one is there's living donation, and obviously it's only organs that you have two of and you can spare one, or like the liver where you, they can take part. So there's live donor li liver transplantation. Uh, there's, li sorry, living donor liver and living donor kidney. Um, the question sounds like it's specifically about um, deceased donors. So um, when deceased donors, um, uh, when somebody has died, is brain dead, or is about to suffer cardiac death and the organ bank is called in, they have a protocol to do a number of tests to ensure that the um, organs would not carry disease, infections, or cancers predominantly, but any disease, um, to the recipients. The um, The... What was the second half of the question? How do we ensure? What rules are in place to ensure that Oh, your that people's are wishes are respected. Yeah. Right, so if um, in America, um, when you die, your body actually becomes um, property of your next of kin. So there are rules that sort of dictate that. Now the, you can sign your organ donor card on your license. Um, but I don't know if you remember the, the um, public uh, health push recently that was tell your family because it's very upsetting to a family who's just gotten this awful news that their loved one has died to then also hear about um, their wishes for organ donation at the same time. Sometimes it's confusing. Um, but what teams from the organ bank have found is that it's very important to separate out the team that is caring for the person who's then, who then dies and the team that is going to ask for um, agreement for organ procurement. Now, if um, family members are basically standing outside the room saying, you know, we don't believe our loved one is actually dead and get away, you're not actually gonna take any organs, the organ bank does not 
you know, have hospital security come and remove the family physically because, you know, we're going to abide by the person's wishes. What they don't do is go to the family and say, we're looking for your uh, consent for donation because the patient is, the person who's died has already granted consent through the organ donor card. Um, but they inform them of their wishes and explain to them how the process will go. And the organ bank, I, I'm not from the organ bank, and so I, I hope I'm representing what they do adequately. Um, probably somebody in the process could explain it better, but I know that they um, work a lot on the um, sensitive but e effective methods of having the person's wishes honored. Great. Thank you to our speakers. Thanks for coming. See you again on October 28th.